Welcome to Outside the Lines with Ron and Scooter. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Outside the Lines with Ron and Scooter at the Fairlawn Athletic Club in Fairlawn, New Jersey. Our first topic of the course of this segment will be about the trade deadline, the Yankees and the Mets. We're going to start with Ron's New York Mets, and then I'll pick up after that. Yeah, so I know uh, some Mets fans are not happy with the way they they went through the trade deadline here, but it, it was pretty much what I had expected. They were not going to sell out their long-term plan in order to get a couple of rental players to, to get a wild card for this year. They're really looking ahead to 25, 26, 27. And with the prices of the players that were traded, especially starting pitching, uh, there were some teams who played paid an exorbitant amount of money. And and in, obviously also in um, prospects and such. So the Mets were not going to go down that path. They, they bolstered their bullpen. They got a good starting pitcher filled in uh, for some of the spots. It, would it have been better if the Mets maybe didn't play as well over the past three or four weeks and maybe ended up being complete sellers and, and really raked in a big haul? Uh, time will tell on that, but at least they didn't sell the farm system out for and, and give up the future for what they did get. And they did all that because they got on a hot streak. I mean, had they not yeah. got on that hot streak, who knows what would have happened. They might have just traded everybody and start from scratch. Well, you, you look at what other teams got for some of the, especially the pitchers, and if the Mets were then going to give up Minaya, Severino, um, you know, and whoever else, maybe not much out of the bullpen, but, and Alonzo as well, what kind of hole they could have gotten. Uh, from trading those types of players. But they hit the hot streak. They were trying to go for the wild card, and they're still in the thick of it. So we'll see how the season ends up. And hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? Exactly. Now, give me your gut feeling. You're going to pursue Alonzo at the end of the season, correct? I believe the Mets have every intention of pursuing Alonzo. Uh, it really depends upon what he's asking for in terms of the contract. I've heard numbers of somewhere around 10 and 450 million, you know, 10 years, 450 million dollars. I don't know that he's worth that. I mean, you look at his uh, runners in scoring position statistics, and every year it's gone down and down and down. And I think this year he's somewhere around 220, 230 with runners in scoring position. Is that a 45 million dollar man? I, I personally don't think so. And you're going to pursue Soto also, correct? I think the Mets are, are very high on Soto, and I think they're ready to just throw the whole bank at him. Okay. Well, we hope you don't do that, because I want him. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I agree with you. Everything you said was right on. The Mets have got a hot streak going, and I hope they continue, because I want to play them in the World Series again, so we can beat them. But I know your team will be good. On the Yankees' standpoint, they didn't really do much either. We got the, an infielder, outfielder from... Uh, Florida Marlins. It was a you know dump salary type deal, and we picked up uh, Mark Leiter's son, which has been very good for us. I would put him in as the closer because uh, I'm not too happy with the Yankees. Uh, the bullpen is not; it's very sketchy. One day they're good, one day they're bad, and uh, the other thing is right now that they're walking Judge left and right because there's no protection after Judge gets up. You have Soto batting before him. What I would do is put Soto after him. So then you have to bat and pitch to judge. So that's another problem. And this ain't the old Steinbrenner Yankees either. He doesn't go out there and spend the money. The Suns are very uh, budget-minded. They don't want to spend. So whatever they got, they're going to take it because they're going to still fill the stadium. There's 45, 50,000 people there every night, and uh, that's the way it goes. Unfortunately, I'm a little spoiled because I'm used to George. Not that he did all the right things all the time either. I mean, he would just spend and get players. And we haven't had a good player that we picked up with the trade deadline since Dave Justice. He's gotten a lot of bad ones over the years. He just threw money away. But that's what happens. Well, speaking of Judge, I mean, I, I don't understand as a, a visiting player or, or an opponent of the Yankees why in God's name you would ever pitch the Judge. Same thing with Barry Bonds back in, in right. you know, in, in the early 2000s when he was hitting like 70 home runs a year. Why in God's name would you pitch to him? Oh, I, I'm, I, I agree with you. I, I would force the other players to, to produce. hit, yeah. produce, and produce. do something. And if I give up the run because Judge comes around off after the walk, I'll eat it. So be it. It's better than 
him hitting a two or three on home run every time he's up. Sure. No, you're right. And the analytics shows you that. I mean, yeah. you know, that's the way it is. Well, we're going to move on to a few other things. We found out uh, recently that Phil Simms was let go by uh, CBS, and uh, Fox is picking him up for the pre-game, pre-season uh, for the Giants. And uh, take it from there, they already have Brady as their number one announcer over there, so we'll see what happens with that down the road. But I, I like Phil Sims. He was a good announcer. He was good in studio analysis, and he's a homeboy. What can they say? Yeah, well, same thing with Boomer Esiason. He yes. he lost his contract there too. They didn't re-up him, and they were going in a different direction. Uh, you know, we had talked earlier off camera about the cost cutting that CBS was looking to do. So we'll we'll see how it goes for this year and see what what other position uh, announcers they've moved around. The only good thing about Boomer here is his morning show with Geo, and um, that's on FAN and. He gives a good insight into football and his hockey. He loves his hockey. He loves his Rangers. And uh, that's basically it. Uh, Olympics. The United States is doing awesome in the Olympics. I mean, Simone Biles, she's just, she just an outstanding. Uh, go USA, yes. Go USA. <laughs> I mean, Simone Biles is just, what an athlete. I mean, what can you say that she's America? I mean, that's the way you could say it. she's America. You know, and the thing that, that can't be missed with Simone Biles as well is the fact that, you know, she suffered from depression. She was mm -hmm. going through uh, counseling and everything else, and she's still, you know, talking to her counselor and stuff from Paris, and she says it's helped her. And, and I applaud her for coming out with, with this mm -hmm. because it is a stigma and people don't really uh, look positively upon it, but the, there should be no shame in it. I mean, if you have a disease, if you have a problem, come out and, and get help for it. So... You know, exactly. anybody even watching, call and get help. That's what it's out there for. And it, it brings awareness to people that, hey, Absolutely. I can get help. Look at look at her. She's in front of the camera, and, and I can excel, and I can beat this, this disease. Yeah. yeah. I can beat it. Absolutely. Um, the other thing is, I, I like when father and son play together. And LeBron James, they just signed LeBron James' son to a contract. So I hope I hope it works out well for him. He's going to learn off if he's half of what his father is. We're in for another 10 good years of basketball from the LeBron family. Okay. All right, so that's it. We're going to cut the break. We'll be back right after this. Uh, we got a little special surprise here. Scooter's brought some stuff in from when he was the Yankee Bat Boy, so we'll find out more about that in a minute. In life, things aren't scripted. If you're an athlete, we need people like you and translate those skills to officiate. You can get a lot out of it. It happens in every town, in every game. We never have a perfect game, but the rewards always outweigh the negativities. Welcome back to Outside the Lines with Ron and Scooter. Uh, this segment, we're going to be talking about Scooter and his time as being a Yankee Bat Boy. So I'm really curious, how, how do you get to end up being a Bat Boy for the New York Yankees? And, and when was this? This was 1971. My dad was a bus driver in the Bronx, and uh, most of the ushers went on his bus at the end of the games. So like at the end of May, a lot of the kids were getting ready to get out of school, and they were going on vacation. They would go on vacation first then come back and be the bat boy. So my dad was on the bus and a couple of them come and said, we're looking for some bat boys. So my father goes, he pointed, I was, I was on the bus that day, ironically. He goes, ask him, he'll do it, I'm sure he will. I didn't ask price or anything. I just said, when do you want me there? <laughs> and and it, it was awesome. <clears throat> I mean, it, it's not what you think that you're gonna get. They frisked, frisked you when you got in, they frisked you when you left. They gave you a whole bunch of rules. You couldn't talk to the players unless they said something to you. Basically, you were there to work, and that's it. Don't fraternize with anybody. You can't talk to the fans. Nothing. You were, you were like in a, in a box. So everybody said, oh, you, you're going to get free stuff. You get nothing for was free. The only thing I got free was a, a bottle of water, and we had a cooler there, and uh, they gave us a sandwich. That was it. But you had to have it when they told you you can have it. So You were like in prison, basically. And it was run by the CBS 
network. Steinbrenner didn't own it when I was the at that point. So what year was that? School? That was 1971, and the Yankees weren't really that good back then either. You'd get like 4,000 people in the stadium of a 70,000 stadium seated capacity. Um, but I, I got to know a couple of the players. Thurman Munson was very nice to me. Roy White was extremely nice to me. Um, the manager was horrible. Ralph Houck, the major, he was horrible. He was old, cranky old guy. A lot of the guys brought their home life into the stadium when they came in, so you knew when, when it was a bad day, their, their expression was on their face. I mean, uh, some of them were hung over. I mean, I could tell you a few stories, but I don't want to embarrass some of them. Some of them ain't around anymore either, so. But it wasn't all, it cranked up. I could have probably wrote a book about it, to be honest with you. But uh, it was enjoyable. And one of my favorite treasures was uh, Thurman Munson and I had a picture take. That was one of the things they gave us. They said, pick a player that you'd like to have your picture taken with. I originally wanted Bobby Mercer, but he was in a bad mood that day. So I got my picture taken with Thurman Munson, and I cherish it to this day. And he's my all-time Yankee player. So, Also, they used to have only a couple of giveaway days. So in 1967, when they had their first bat day, you went to the game, and it was randomly whatever came out of the box, that's what you got. Well, I got a Mickey Mantle bat. This is from 1967, and I, I never used it. Never used it. Anything I ever got at the giveaways, I never used. So that's uh, but I, that I cherish, Ron. And you can you can touch it. Sure. You don't have to have gloves on. <laughs> 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 yeah, anybody can. It's uh, it, it's something I really cherish, though. And I also got a note in the mail <clears throat> over the week to bring this up. Elson Howard lived in Teaneck, New Jersey, and I, the, one of the people that that sent me this was uh, Bob Sharples. He played ball with uh, Elson Howard's son in Teaneck. Now, I don't know if you knew this. Elson Howard devised a uh, donut, a weighted donut that would go on the bat. So it wasn't on the market yet. He brought it down to the Little League game. They put it on the bat, so they went to take it off. It wouldn't come off. <laughs> so they're banging the bat and banging the bat and banging the bat, and it wouldn't come off. He goes, he, he, that Elson Howard was so embarrassed, he went home, he goes, I don't know what I'm going to do now. That was a bad uh, first impression for them. But it went on to be one of the biggest sellers in baseball. So if you see, if you see the donut out there, that was started by Elston Howe. That was a, that was a nice thing. Uh, also, the Yankees, I, I, I used to go to like 35, 40 games a year at the Yankee Stadium. Paid for everyone, no discounts, even when I was a bat boy, no discounts. I go there today and say, as a Yankee bat boy, I don't get a discount. It's, that's just the way it is. There's no, uh, no perks other than being there. And, you know, you figured they'd give you a baseball to take home? No way. If it was muddy and wet from the game, nothing. We would, uh, we would also, my, my major job was to be on the on-deck circle with the batter. Uh, used to use the pine tar rags. Um, used to use a metal uh, pipe. That, was, that came out by Boo Powell. So if you remember Boo Powell in the 70s, he used to always have that metal uh, bat. He was the first so, baseman for the Orioles. That's correct. Yes, he was. Do you want to ask me any more questions about that? Of course, point? I want to ask All you right. more questions. Right. You just opened up this whole can of worms here. Okay. And we don't want to embarrass anybody, but yeah, I want to embarrass people. Tell me a story. <laughs> um, okay. I could tell you. Pick somebody who's dead. Story. Pick somebody that's dead? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Joe Pepitone. You've known Joe. Everybody knows Joe Pepitone. He was a wild. He was the <laughs> wild guy of the Yankees. And everybody thought that, that was his hair, but that wasn't his hair. He had a wig. <laughs> so they used to play tricks on him. They used to play tricks on him. They would get a, a mouse, a fake mouse, and put it underneath there, and he was definitely afraid of all that stuff. So they had it in, by his locker, so he went to grab it to put it on his head, and the mouse said he went nuts. He went nuts. <laughs> I mean, he went into Ralph House's office. He goes, that can't be done. I don't like that. Because he, he was the guy that was the jokester to begin with. So they got even with him, and it happened. But I, I, I got along with him, but he was a little on the wild side. Good guy, though, Joe Pepitone. I liked him a lot. Another well, you, you kind of ruined the, you know, the well, stigma of being a ball boy here. You know, it, it, that you were just, like, working and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I had to clean the spikes. We had to take all the laundry in at the end of the game and bring it to the, uh, the, the uh, washing machine. And then the trainer would take care of that. And the uh, Pete Sheehy was the equipment manager. A very famous Yankee uh, 
quit me. He was there for over 50 years. Another nice man. I had a lot of good talks with him. He, used, he was there when Babe Ruth played, so he told us a lot of Babe Ruth stories. A lot of Babe Ruth stories. <laughs> some were funny, some were not funny. But he took good care of Babe Ruth. Well, what we seem to forget is that these people are human no matter what happens. Absolutely. And, and you got to see a little bit of that inner sanctum where, you know, they, they don't have their guard up and, mm -hmm. you know, TV cameras rolling and everything else. So you, you got to see some of that, I which, did. you know, it takes a little of a luster off from, you know, me being a kid at home watching TV going, oh, my God, I would do anything to just be a ball boy, right? Sure. Absolutely. <clears throat> so. it, it was a great experience, trust me. I, I Even though nothing got taken or, you know, you couldn't get any extra stuff. That's another thing. They frowned upon even getting an autograph from the players, even after the game. Nothing nothing of the sort. So that was a little bit of a bummer for me because I would have loved to have some of their autographs. So. All right, so we're at the next break already, and we have a special guest coming up. We're going to be talking about pickleball, and we'll be back in a few moments. And you're going to learn all about pickleball, the new sport that is taking over this country by storm. We'll be back. Are you an enthusiastic sports fan? Want to have fun and get in on the action? Heck yes, that'd be awesome. Have great attention to detail? Want to stay active? Definitely. Want to give back to the student athletes in your community? Obviously, yes. Then you'd make an excellent high school sports official. We need more officials in New Jersey, because with no high school officials, there are no high school sports. Sign up today at highschoolofficials.com. Welcome back to Outside the Lines. We are here with Sue Benjamin to talk about pickleball, which, is, as I said, is taking over this country by storm. Fairlands apparently got its own pickleball court, and Scooter and I know nothing about pickleball, so we come to the expert to find out what we need to do to learn how to play this awesome game. Sue and I go back 40 years. She's also an awesome softball player, <laughs> and she's the high school coach of the women's softball team. So let's give her a hand on that. Come on. Right, right. Woo -hoo! <laughs> and Sue's been trying to have a pickleball court in Fairlawn for probably five years. Yeah, right? something like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to turn it over to her. She's going to tell us all about pickleball. All right. Well, um, Thank you for having me, Scooter and Ron. Um, it's great to be here. I want to tell you, tell you a little bit about pickleball. Um, first, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of pickleball. It's been around since 1965, although it really got popular the last five years or so. People started playing a lot um, during COVID, and, um, and it's a sport that can be played by many different people, all different age abilities. You can play when you're five years old. You can play when you're 90 years old. So it's a, it's a great sport. Um, it is the fast and growing sport in America. Thank you, Ron, for noticing that. And we also have, there's Major League Pickleball. There, New Jersey has a professional pickleball team called the New Jersey Fives. Um, but let's get back to uh, local pickleball here in Fairlawn. So um, we did ask about five years ago or so, the town took a couple of courts over by the Warren Point Annex, a tennis court and made two pickleball courts. And then two years ago, we went to the council and asked for um, more pickleball courts and the rec department. And they got together and created eight beautiful outdoor courts for us um, over by the Warren Point Annex, which is on Pellick Drive and 29th Street, right around that neighborhood. There's four on one sex side of uh, the street and then another four outdoor courts on the other side of the street. Um, so you can come by there any day and see people playing pickleball. Very busy on the weekends. And a lot of, and very busy also in the evenings. So what is pickleball? Well, they say if uh, tennis, badminton, and ping pong, ping pong got together and had a baby, they'd call it pickleball. Wow, so, that's nice. I like that. Nice, okay. very good. All right, and this actually is an example of a pickleball. This is an indoor pickleball, and this is an outdoor pickleball. Um, so the difference in these is the number of holes. It's basically for wind resistance. So more holes for the outdoor ball so the ball doesn't take off as much less holes and bigger wider holes for the indoor ball but they're just like wiffle balls that you guys probably played with as a kid mm -hmm. um, and it's very light uh, easy to hit these are pickleball paddles so I'll just give examples of a couple pickleball paddles um, they range in price anywhere from $50 to $250 and then some I'm sure 
They have to have the same um, measurements. This is a long handled pickleball and this is a short handled pickleball, but they both pretty much uh, do the same thing. The price differential is based on the material. For some, you can get more spin. Here's an example of a long handled one, a short handled one. That's a little wider. Um, and then they also have difference in thickness. Some will be thicker than another. The thicker one is for control, the thinner ones are for um, power. But how is the game played? Okay, so we have a pickleball court, which is like a baby tennis court. And this is an example or a, a sketch of what the court would look like. Um, each, you have two different service boxes on the right side and the left side. Uh, they're 10 by 15, and you would serve from, diagonally from one to the other, one corner to the next corner. And then you have an area in the middle. This is called the non-volley zone. It's seven feet away from the net. The net is about 34 inches high. Um, that area in the middle, called the non-volley zone, is everyone calls it the kitchen. That's the slang term for it, kitchen. So there's rules about being in the kitchen when you play pickleball. When you're in the kitchen, you can't hit a volley, so you can't hit a ball in the air. Um, you have to let it bounce and then hit it. And that's what allows a person that's five foot four on a good day um, play against somebody that's six foot three. So you can still um, be able to play against them because they can't come right up to the net and slam it like you could in tennis. Um, so those are the court dimensions. And basically, um, the way the game is played is the person, you have two people, generally you can play singles or doubles. But if you're playing doubles, um, the person on the right would serve the ball diagonally. It has to bounce once. Then uh, their opponent would return the ball. It has to bounce a second time. And then after that, either person can hit it, and it can be zero bounces or one bounce. Um, and the game is scored, generally played to 11, and, um, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's, uh, it's just as much exercise as it is socialization for many people, and uh, I've had a lot of fun teaching it and playing it. So, so Sue, in, in terms of physical activity, if it, if you were someone who's a little bit older, maybe doesn't get out too much, is this slow enough where they could play and not have to worry about getting injured, or is this still more of a younger person's game? Well, actually, when I first started playing, the average age was 62, and now it's probably in the uh, below 40, the average age. But yes, um, you can play. It's like the kind of sport that you can play. You just need to find similar people that are in the same activity level as yourself. So yes, is the answer. Is there any kind of like warm up that? Like I'm um, like up from outside listening to you and watching, <coughs> like I did the other day. Actually, on Sunday I passed by. There was 25 people playing. There was a big line to wait to play. Yeah, that was in demand. Is there like a warm up type? Yeah, thing the couple hurt? things that you want to make sure is that you would have is um, uh, good court sneakers. You want to make sure you stretch before you play. Um, it's really important to do that, especially your legs and um, safety goggles as well um, are, are recommended. But yeah, the number one injury from pickleball is um, from falling um, backwards. That's by people going for balls that are hit over their head. And we always tell them, another option you have besides going back for that ball is just to say, hey, good shot, and then be around to play the next point. Um, and then the second biggest injury is, is uh, like I'd say, a uh, calf pull, and that's just from not stretching. But those, both of those things are preventable in different ways. So, so how about practicing? if? I don't have somebody to play with right now, but I want to practice just a little bit. I know Berdan Grove has the uh, handball court with oh, the yeah. big wall. Have you seen me there? I haven't. <laughs> that, that's why I'm asking the question. So I guess the answer is yes, I can go there and practice by myself against you hitting can. it against the wall. You can. You can do that. Um, practice your serves. Practice your, your touch against the wall. But I would say the best thing about this sport, which is different than many other sports, is that it's a sport, um, and the way Fairlawn has put the four courts together and then another four courts, courts together, is you can go there by yourself, show up, be like, oh, hey, I'm Sue, can I get the next game? And everyone's going to say yes. Um, so you just put your paddle up, they have like a rotation system. Um, I've done that the last three nights. I just walk in and, um, you know, I may or may not know people and just put my uh, paddle up and then... Um, and then not you're next in, and you get to play with uh, other people, meet other people. It's a great, great uh, socialization as well as exercise. Well, believe it or not, we are at the end of another segment. Wow. And this stuff goes really quick. So, Sue, thank you so much for coming out and explaining this to us. I, maybe you'll find me there at the weekend watching you to play, and maybe oh. I'll try and make a fool of myself and 
and actually get out there with a paddle and come on out. We have community school has classes. We have the senior uh, Fair Lawn for All Ages has classes. That's um, great. great way. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. We'll both do it. We'll make a date yeah. on that. Awesome. All right, awesome. Thank you. We're going to see thank you again you. on the next episode of Outside the Lines with Ron and Scooter. And again, Sue, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. Outside the Lines was filmed at the Fair Lawn Athletic Club and would like to thank them for their hospitality. The cast and crew of Outside the Lines, thank you for watching. For information or to be a guest on Outside the Lines, please contact us at the number on your screen.